Okay, so since this is the first day back, I have got a plan of going through about five different subjects in not so, so much great detail. That there. So, that there. That there. As I recall, the last thing we did before we left is we did the keypad lab, right? And I went over the LCD. I have not demonstrated the LCD yet, and I, and I will do that yet. That there, I have to. I have to put that circuit together, and today I did not have time to do that. That there, well, I had some there. I didn't have time. I was busy doing some other things. Well, I'm, I'm going to change directions completely today and talk about motors right there. And I've got a series of. Uh, app notes that I'm going to kind of go through and I'm not going to go through them in great detail simply uh, because it's going to change with each and first off let's start off with app note 191 that's a good one to start with right there and app note 191 at the, at the, and before I get started here Anything you see, the, the term app note is a application notice from the manufacturer of the chip. These are very good sources to learn how to use because this is what Silicon Labs puts out as an introduction of how to use their chip to do different things. Out there. And they're better than textbooks in the fact that they speak to a particular processor with a particular application, and they're normally written by engineers and not college professors. That there, and that's a huge advantage because college professors sometimes teach things that don't work. That there, you know. In other words, you know things that I do in the, here in class, the demonstrations aren't necessarily practical of what you would want to do in the real world. That there. In my case, I like to think that I'm a little better than some because I've worked in the real world off and on that there over the last 30 some years. The last two years, I've not been in the real world. I've been in Malaysia. Not that Malaysia is not the real world, but I'm not working in industry as a design engineer. So when I say I'm not in the real, I'm not working in the real world. That doesn't mean Malaysia is not the real world. It means that I'm university is not the real world in terms of engineering applications out there. The folks that out in industry, that's what I re when I talk about real world applications. So the people that write these app notes are engineers that work doing design work. Now most of these are written either by customers of Silicon Labs who put together a little app note for a couple hundred bucks or whatever, or a couple thousand, whatever, or a free dinner at a conference or something. You, know, you never know what they're getting paid. Or they're written by applications engineers that work for Silicon Labs that go out to customers and help them solve problems. That's the, so, so this is App Note 191 and you normally find these on the manufacturer's website or talking to their sales reps. They will give that there. And this particular one is motor control software examples. Right there. And before I get started here, let me talk about the different types of motors that we're, we're looking at right here. And here, you know, this one talks about DC motors. And not only do I have got a headache, but I've got flying Silas tops right there. Right there. A DC motor right there, which a DC motor is one that if I put a plus direction and a minus direction and the current flows in this direction, it's going to rotate in a particular direction. If I reverse this right here, if I reverse this and put the minus and the plus, it'll rotate in the other direction. So these are bi-directional motors. We can control the the direction of rotation that there. The speed in which the motor turns is a function of the voltage across it right there, up to a particular point right there. So, you know, typically it takes a certain voltage before it starts to go, then it's linear, then it levels off, and you put too much voltage across it, you let the smoke out and the thing burns up right there. But you, you, you have a linear range where the, the motor is somewhat proportional to the speed 
right there. So now the way we do this with a microprocessor is we don't have, or microcontroller, we have analog outputs, but they're not practical right there. We use something called pulse width modulation. Modulation right there. And I've got some other slides I'll talk about that. But pulse width modulation basically means that I've got a series of pulses right there. Right here. And we have a frequency from here to here. T equals 1 over the frequency. And then we have a pulse width right there. The width of the pulse and in proportional we have something called the duty cycle right there the duty cycle is equal to the pulse width divided by the period of the pulses right there so a hundred percent duty cycle looks like this zero percent duty cycle looks like this and maybe ten percent might look like this right there where it's on say for one millisecond and this is 10 millisecond period right there so it's on 10 percent of the time right there so typically body will wait till the end of the class before I let him join the, the group right there right there but we when we look at this particular right there and we have on almost all modern microcontrollers we have a pulse width generator. Our particular microcontroller, and I'm not going to go into a great detail, we have a program right there, <laughs> and right there, uh, with our microcontroller. It's called the configuration wizard, actually configuration wizard number two, and on our microcontroller, if we go to PCAs, which are our programmable, programmable counter arrays, which are some of those peripherals we talked about way back when, right there, in module zero, for example, I can tell it that I want this to be an 8-bit pulse width modulator right there. So in other words, I'm going to use this particular module as a pulse width generator right there. I want it to be 8-bit. I want it to be on port 0.0, .0 right there. If I want it on another port, I can move it to another port. But I can adjust what pin this output is going to come on right there. Right there. And I want it to have, say, a 40% duty cycle right there. Right there. And this actually tells me, if you can read that, the, the ladies up front might be able to read that. That says 40.23% duty cycle right there. This tells us what the registers are going to set be set for in order to get that duty cycle right there. And if I hit OK, this generates the code, which I would stick into my code, to create that particular pulse with gener gener generator. If I want to change the pulse width, all I do is change this register right here PCA0, PH0, right there. And again, that goes from reading the data book. Because of the nature of this course, I'm not going to force you to understand the data book in great detail. Matter of fact, I'm going to go through a demo where I'm going to actually just drive it using the Arduino, which is much easier. Right there. So, but again, this particular app note is based on using you know, I pulse with generator in order to create that there. So let me just kind of go through that there. The code written was originally written for the 8051 300. It can be ported to other devices. This also uses the ADC. We're not. We'll talk about the ADC later in this in the course right there. But in the main thing, the PCA has several, and this talks about the fact that it uses the 8 bit. Uh, pulse width modulator is ideal for most small motor control applications. So if, if we're controlling most small motors, we're going to use some type of pulse width generation. Now DC motors, we increase the pulse width, increase the speed. 
Now there's another type of motor which is what I'm going to demonstrate today and that's called the servo motor right there and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But as we go through and we look at this particular one here, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the speed of the motor is a function of the voltage right here. You see four volts we're going to go, again this is the load line, this is what our load is. So at four volts we're going to have this speed, at six volts we'll have this speed, and and I think I'm better off here. Four volts, this is our speed. This load line is a function of the load on the motor right there. How much, you know, how many, you know, I want to see uh, Newton meters of torque you're putting on as far as the load goes, or we would say foot pounds in the U.S. But how much, you know, how much does this motor happen to, that is happen to move? So at 12 volts, it's going to go out at this speed right here. So as you can see, that there. Now, when we look at motor control, right there, right there, is that our voltage DC is roughly equal to our duty cycle, percent duty cycle, right there, times our so V source, right there. Now, normally, our source voltage is going to go through some type of transistor right there. So normally, and this particular drawing shows, for example, right here, we're operating with 12 volts right there, right there. Here's our motor. This right here just happens to be a shunting uh, diode in, in order to prevent burning the motor up when you turn it on and turn it off. This is our switching transistor to turn our motor on and off very quickly right there. So this is a switch. This is our PW output, PWM output from our transistor, or I mean from our microcontroller. It drives through a inverter, our motor control right there. Now this happens to be, if you look at the code, it's reading the, it's reading the, um, the analog port in order to adjust the speed using a potentiometer in the code. I'm not going to go through the code in great detail. I just want to kind of go through the whole idea how this is working. And trust me, one of the questions on previous finals exam is I give this circuit and I say, explain to me how it works. Right there. A key thing here is this output is PWM right there, pulse width modulation right there. So, and that turns the motor on and off. This is a one direction DC motor controller uh, using the 8051 right there. And this circuit is the same whether I'm using the 8051 or the Arduino or the Silk or Raspberry Pi or an 8086 through an output port. Oh, okay, finally, my headache's starting to subside. You guys may have to suffer through a full hour that there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it? That there, it's a, it's not a pain reliever. It, what it does is, headaches or migraines are caused by blood constrict here up. The blood vessels in the brain constrict and reduce the flow, and this particular medication just opens everything up, <laughs> right there, and, which sometimes makes me lightheaded. But I'm sitting down, so I won't fall down, right there. Okay, but this is a typical motor controller coming from a microcontroller, right there. So again, I will put a big star here, a big word final exam and I will post this app note up on the web right there so that there along you know that there but all the only thing magical about this is that this is a PWM output and it turns on the switch on and off this is an easy one I'm going to go through one that's a little bit more complicated right there so this is our DC motor right there again the power of MOSFET is driven by an inverting gate driven that there. The port pins are configured as inputs with uh, blah, blah, there. Remain high, right there. And somewhere in here, he'll explain the software initializes it there, while loop. And the potentiometer reads the DC voltage from the pot and outputs the value to the register that I just mentioned right there, PCA0. CPH zero, huh. right there. And I don't expect you to remember that register number, by the way. You don't. You don't need to remember that. But it just simply outputs 
the input of the A to D to the duty cycle. So actually, if you look at the code, which is clear down at the bottom right here, right here, if you look at the code right here, all this is all set up right here. You know, so ignore that for this discussion right here. This is all set up. And all we're doing is we're reading this function called average VN right there. And this is getting the output of the, or the input of the, from the eight analog to digital converter in a number between 0 and 255. In other words, an 8-bit a, a, 8 bit a to D. And it's just sticking that number in that particular right there. So, and as you look at right there, and, and again, all we're doing is we're just reading it 64 times, and then we're just doing a divide by. And actually, this sum right shifted six times is a divide by 64 right there is what that is. Because every time you shift to the right once, it's divided by two, right there. So if I've got the number zero zero one one zero one zero zero, that there, that's three two or three four hex. If I shift it over, it's zero 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 one one zero one zero. That's now going to be one a. And if you did, if you did it. The, the divide by I shift it over once more. It's a divide by that's a divide by two. Shift it over once more. It's a divide by four. And all we're doing is we're doing a divide by sixty-four. So we're shifting it four times. But all this, all this right here, this com command here is result is equal to sum divide by sixty-four. We'll give you the same thing right there. So that's just an easy way of doing the divide by without doing an actual divide by right there. And a lot of program or hardware people tend to think that way. The optimizing compiler will automatically change it to a shift, right shift by six, if it sees a divide by 64. The compiler is smart enough to know that the right shift six is quicker than a divide by. It uses fewer instructions, so that's why he does this instead of the divide by right there. But all we're doing is we're reading it 64 times and we're taking the average. And then we're returning it back that there. And that's what goes right there. So so if the pot's all the way off, we set our duty cycle to zero. If the pot's all the way on, we set our duty cycle to 200 to, to, uh, to 100%. Because all we're doing is we put a number between 0 and 255 into this register. If the number is 0, we get duty cycle 0. If our, if our number is 255, our duty cycle is that there. And again, you can see that if I go back and run this right here. Right here. If I change my duty cycle to, say, 90%, right there. You're going to see actually it's a minus one out there, so it's going to give one nine there. If I change it to 10%, it's actually E6. Actually our duty cycle is 255 minus that there. So our pot would go the opposite direction right there. Because we start off at E6 and we go to FF when we roll over we turn it off. So it's so that's the that's what we load it to. When it overflows, it shuts the duty off that there. So actually, our duty cycle right there is going back to right here. Our duty cycle is going to be whatever our number is right there, 255 minus that times 100 percent right there over 255 right there. So it's the ratio right there. So if we want a duty cycle of, of say 30%, we would then figure out the number we would need to where we're going to count up 30% of that there. So we would just simply 
take 0.7 times 255. That would be the number we would put in there. So if we put 0.7 times that there, and hopefully this works right here, otherwise we go through 0 0.7 times 255 is 178. So if I go back to my software right here and and if I put, I said 30%, right? So that's B3. And X B three is one seventy nine. I had one seventy eight. So, so that's actually, that's what you would end up putting into that right there. So again, when we want when we want a particular duty cycle, what we would put in again is we would put in one minus our desired duty cycle. I'm just going to put DC right there. And that's a number between 0 and 1 right there. Right there. Times 255 is what we would load into that register right there. That's the formula you would use right there. Right there. So if we want, you know, 15% duty cycle, so this would be 0 0.85 times 255 right there right there. And we then would convert that to hex, that's what we load into that right there. So, okay. And by the way, that sometimes changes with different processors, so don't register that 100% in your memory, that that's always the formula because that's the way it works with the 8051. Right there. So, okay. Right there. Alright, getting back to my discussion on my app note, right there. Right there. That's in right there. So that's our here. This is a full bridge here. Now this one's a little bit different because here we've got multiple paths which we can run our DC current. That there we can either turn on this one run it through here and then run back through here or we could turn this one and run it back through here so our current can go this way or it can go this way right here so this operates very similar to a full full wave rectifier right there so we can turn on port one zero dot two with a pulse width modulation and bring it back to right here or we can go the other way around right there so this is a reversing DC mode right there right there where we can control the direction now this is probably not the most efficient way of doing this the most efficient way is to use something called an H bridge right there this happens to be the way that they talk about it but you can use an H bridge as well an H bridge right here and Hopefully I've got one here. No. But I just pull up one here. Do I have each bridge? Yep, I'll have to do a search for it. Right there. And Trying to find one. It's got a good data sheet for it right there, but uh, yeah, we'll pull up the tutorial. That's as good as anything here on the Arduino right here. This is this is like the one I've got in my office right there. This is a typical H bridge right there, and this particular H bridge has on it. And uh, well, that doesn't help me much right there, but we'll talk we'll talk a little bit about this right here. When we look at it right here, pins 1 and 2 and 13 and 14 are my plus minus for my DC motors. And those don't change right there. So in other words, 
This is a dual H brake, so it'll drive two different motors right there. So if you look at it, it has a very few set of directions here. Pins one and two is for motor one. Pins 13 and 14 is for motor two, right there. Right here. So DC motor two plus minus, DC motor one plus minus right there. Pin three is a well, well, <coughs> remove this if you're using a supply. So again, three is just a little jumper right here. As long as you're at 12 volts or less, you're, you're okay. You can just leave that jumper there. Otherwise, you have to pull it out right there. Pin 5 is a ground right here. This is pin 5 ground. And pins 4 and 6 are your motor supply if greater than 15. Oh, what did I do right here? Right there. Now, when we look at pins 8, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 13, and that there, those are our control pins right there. So the digital pins are right there, and those control the direction right there. Right there. So you put a 1 right there, and we got to find the pinouts right there. <coughs> Excuse me. Right there. Right there. And this is actually showing. I was looking for the drawing right here. The, the, the schematic. He doesn't give the schematic. Well, that didn't help me any. Right there. Okay. In other words, pin one and two right there is for motor one. So you'd either write. Normally, what you would do is you write a PWM signal to pin nine and ground pin eight. Or write a PWM signal to pin eight and ground pin in one right there. So you ground one and you write PWM to the other, and you can reverse the two right there. So that would change the direction of the motor right there. So when we look at right here, so so D10 to a module that there, remove the jumper that there, remove the jumper right there. The motor direction is controlled by sending a high or low signal to each channel right there. A high to one and a low will turn to one direction. A low and a high will right there. This explains, this right here explains how, and my, I think this is a case where the mouse works better. Okay. This explains how we would write turn the motor in one direction or the other. Now, again, the motors will not turn until a high is sent to the enable, pin 7, or 12 that there. So actually, you can, you can what you can do is you can use a PWM signal on the enable line right there and just put it right high or low to the, to the two direction pins. So look at pins 1, 2, 3, Pins 8 through 11, I, I in 1, I in 2, I in 3, I in 4, those are our, that there, those are our direction pins. So you either take one VCC and two, and I'm talking about here, these, these two pins right here. Um, when I say 1 and 2, I'm talking about those two pins here. So they're actually 8 and 9 on the module. I take one high and two low to go in one direction. I take two low and one high to go in the other direction. Now you can put an inverter and use one pin out of the microcontroller if you want, right there. Just simply, in other words, you would have an output right here called DIR1 and it would go to the pin IIN1 and through an inverter to IN2 right there. So one pin out of the microcontroller can control both pins right there. So right there. So this just simply tells you what direction you want to go in right there. Right there. So right there. And then here we connect the PWM for the speeds between one and two right there to the enable line right there. So this is the typical way right there. The rest of this is directions on how you would do this with the Arduino. And hopefully, maybe by next Thursday, I'll go through and do a little demo on, on the DC motor with the Arduino. It doesn't look very difficult. 
and I've got a DC motor somewhere at home. <laughs> it's actually at home is why I didn't do it right there. Right there. Because the code's right here. Right there. Right there. So, okay. So that's how you would normally run that there. Going back to our app note right there. And actually, I was running the app note from here. Right here. The H bridge replaces all of this right there. So you normally you would use an H bridge instead of all of this right here. And you would wire that up. Again, you've got the same four lines right there. And you would just follow the you know, the, the lines from that there. You would wire it up a little bit better. So I don't necessarily like this particular drawing, but this is how they did it. But the whole the concept's the same whether you're using an H bridge or whether you're using this particular schematic right there. And again, this is the speed control. We're just reading the pot, and this is just simply the reverse. And all it does is change the pins, the high and lows, right there. So, right there. those are the only two circuits on this app note that I'm worried about. This is with voltage sensing. I'm not worried about that. DC, right there. Induction drive. We'll come back to AC motors possibly later, right there. And if you look at the code for the second one right here. It's very similar right there. Main routine is we're getting the average right here, right there. Else, if switch one is not pressed, we just keep going. Otherwise, we coast it for a few seconds, let it coast down, right, wait for it to be released, and then we reverse. When we look at the code for reverse, all we're doing is basically switching the pins around right there. So this is telling to switch to switch our output pins is what it's doing right there. So without getting into much detail, right right there, stop stop the timer, disable it, force all outputs high, disable the crossbar, skip the pin, set this one low, don't skip the pin, set this one low, and then enable the crossbar again, right there. So what it's doing is it's telling it to skip particular pins and tie, and tie them low and high right there. So essentially skips which pins the output is the PC, PC, PWF output is going up there. Okay, the next set of motors I want to talk about and how am I on time? Oh, yeah, we're, we're doing all right since my headache's split. Okay, the next set of motors I want to talk about are called servo motors. And servo motors are motors that Right there. Oh, okay, this is going through the H bridge right there. And okay, this is basically, and this is actually a draw. It's a is a uh, link that you just do a search on introduction of servos using Arduino. The Arduino processor. is a processor like this right here. This is the board. I'm not going to pass around since I've only got one with me here. But it's basically a microcontroller. Very, It's a lower end microcontroller than the 851. It's a cheaper one. A more modern one up there. And this is about as big as they get. <laughs> For the 851 you get up to like 100 pins that they're plus. That there, this one only comes in about like a 28 pin package total. That there, the Arduino was originally built with the idea of teaching young people on how to use microcontrollers and microprocessors. That there, it was never intended to be an industrial strength microcontroller. People have started using it because it's a very easy and cheap way of doing things. That there, this this board itself is 100 ringgits. That includes all the off, all the software and everything to run it, right there. It doesn't include the cable, <laughs> right there. You have to have your own, and it uses the old style USB A type that there. So, and it doesn't include a, a five volt supply. And don't hook up a nine volt supply instead because it tends to let the smoke out. I, I actually it, it come to find out that that I didn't let the smoke out of my. I just said I put it in such a state that I had to hit the reset button. So I bought two new ones thinking that I burned the old one up and that there. 
but this is the Arduino right there and it also has some really neat little little tools for driving servo motors now a servo motor looks like this right here this is the servo motor that I brought right there and this particular motor goes between 0 and 180 degrees roughly very popular motor and I think some of you might be in the microprocessor or the uh, robotics class too right that there but because I just covered this topic in the micro, in the robotics class so if you're in the robotics class this is all repeat <laughs> out there but the servo motor goes between 0 and 180 degrees right there and as it turns out the way that the servo motor works is that we send it a pulse width signal at a 20 millisecond rate no, in other words roughly 20 milliseconds is choo -choo -choo -choo. If I can remember, programmer, scientific, 20E, e, e. I don't see my EE e button right there. Where is it? It's right there. So e. It's got to be there. Oh, uh, well. We'll just go back. If the 20 milliseconds is 0 0.02 seconds, right? So, and 1 over x, you're at a 50 hertz rate. So it's a 50 hertz rate. So 50 times a second, it expects to see a signal between 1 and 2 milliseconds width. So this is a pulse width, pulse width with generating signal with a relatively narrow pulse width right there. And I happen to bring a scope. I probably will, will see that there. I'll, I'll hook up the scope here and, and try to hold it up where you can see it that there where I can change the pulse width and change the direction right there so one millisecond equates to zero degrees rotation two milliseconds equates to 180 degrees now as it turns out the Arduino has built into it a library called uh, servo dot H right there and I need to unplug this so I can plug my Arduino in right there and let's go ahead and set up my and hopefully this is the right one right here I accidentally installed two versions of the Arduino software so that's a little hard to read That's a little easier, isn't it? Not there. Okay. Okay. So again, what we, we've got here in this particular case here is that I've got our code. This is written in, in C, and this is a looks like a totally different language than what you're used to seeing right here. But one of the key factors in this code is the way the Arduino works is there's a function in Arduino called setup. And whenever you run the Arduino, it runs this function one time, right there. It runs it one time. So what we're telling it to do is I've got two pins. One is called servo pin one, or called servo pin, and that's pin nine on the on the Arduino, right there. And then pin two, or, or pin servo pin two, two is attached to pin eight, right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach my servo to pin 8 and I'm going to attach my scope to pin 9 right there. So right right there. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to scan this through between 0 and 180 degrees and go up right there. So I'm going to write and this is going from 0 actually I'm just going to say angle in both cases so I do the same thing right there right there so what I'm going to basically do is I'm going to write the same thing to both pins and the reason is is I want you to see the see the uh, pulse width getting larger and smaller as, as I go through and do that so as I go through here and it's going, it's going to go from from one millisecond to two milliseconds and then back 
to one millisecond or the other way around. I don't remember which way I set this up right there. And I put a delay right here, and I'm going to just set the delay to 10 for both of those, so right there. Now, right there. So first thing I'm going to do is plug in my trusty little board right there. And who knows, I may start doing all the labs with Arduinos if I can get them to if I can get them to buy 20, 20 of them. Because the labs are easier with the Arduinos actually. Right there. So I plug this in and I go to my sketch right there. Verify compile. No errors. Hopefully. It'll come back if there's any errors. Okay, no errors. It tells me on the bottom, you sketch uses this 2290 bytes, 7% of the program area. Variable there, I'm using 59 bytes or 2% 2, 2 of the memory for global variables. So, I, so I've wired it up right at there. So now all I'm going to do is wire the board up. Three wires right there. Red goes to uh, now I get to the case here, 5 volts right there. Black goes to brown right there. And I'm going to put this on pin 9 right there. And you can see it's going one direction. And those at the back that there. Right there. Goes in one direction. And why is it going so fast in the other direction right there? They're both delay 10. Oh, I, I didn't upload it to the board. It's still got the, the old one right there. It's still doing the one that I did at my desk right there. Now, because it should go the same speed both directions right there. Now it is. So, but that's basically how we would program this to go from one right there. So it's going through the loops right there. If I, this is the tricky part because I've got to go through here. And a brown is a brown. Right there. Yeah, where's my scope probe? I there's my scope probe. Right there. Brown. And then ten eight. I'm just going to hold the scope up, maybe. Right there. Well, those of you up front can see it easily. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm plugged into this thing here and I can't move it, but I'll move it up about this far. You can see this pulse width getting wider, getting narrower as this motor goes from one direction to another. So, can you see that in the back somewhat? Back there. But as this motor gets from one extreme to the other right there you can see the two of them go go, go along right there so this is typically and I'm going to disconnect this before I <laughs> drop my scope that's actually my scope that I brought with me that I don't think they give back when these scopes to keep in our little cubicles to that there so right there and I know that they don't have any quite this modern here, do they? Okay, that's the one I brought. It's starting to get old now. <laughs> right there. So, okay. Let me, I'm going to rip everything out here. <laughs> right there. So, that, but that's a standard servo motor. And a standard servo motor is used a lot in various robots. Uh, probably 
within the next week or so, I will bring one of the robots down that we bought for the robotics class and show that we can, you know, set the robot arm by setting the angle on various motors using a similar type program right there. So that we can actually go through and pick up things and move them right there. Right there. So, right there. So that's the standard servo mode right there. Now the other type of motor we have right there. That's the standard servo right there. Again, this all just explains what I just did right there. And again, this particular, now this one here allows us to read a pot. I don't have a pot set up and move the motor according to the pot right there. These are various right there. Now, the next one that I want to talk briefly about is the continuous right there. This is a particular motor that has been modified to turn continuously. Now this one's much harder to see because I don't have the little wheel thing on the front of it. <laughs> so you have to almost take my word that it's going in one direction or the other right there. So it connects the same way right there. But the main thing about this one here is that when we look at it, and it works out almost exactly the same, the only difference is somewhere in here, one point in, I think I got a better, uh, continuous, there. Yeah, let me just find it again here real quick. I downloaded it and I don't see where I downloaded it right there. Oh, here, this is exactly the slide I'm looking for right here. Right here. Is that if we give it a pulse with a 1.5 milliseconds, again, it's the same 20 millisecond period. 1.5 milliseconds, it stops the motor. 1.3 milliseconds, it turns in one direction. 1.7 milliseconds, it, it turns in the other direction, right there. So all, all we do is we control the direction of the motor by adjusting the speed that there. So again, going back to my Arduino, File open recent continuous ser servo right here, right there. Now, again, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set it to 1.7 right there. What did I say the other speed direction was? 1.7, 1.3, right? And then 1.5. So let's go to 1.5. Right there. Copy. One point three. Right there. Now, in this particular case, you'll notice that I actually give it the time in which I wanted to put the high pulse there. So again, I'm going to go ahead, and what I've done here is I turn it in one direction, I stop it, I turn it in another direction, I stop it, and then I just keep repeating. So now we're going to rely on somebody to measure, to put their finger on this and tell me that they're it's switching directions. Okay, that there. But again, we wire this up the same way. Same three wires. I'm going to pin nine BCC and ground. Well, here's our three wires. Fortunately, 
up there. Yell is pin 9. Red is BCC. Shoot 5 volts. And ground is ground. Right there. And before I before I wire this, let's download the sketch. Right there. Ground is ground. I've pinned the black wire here. Mm -hmm. The reason I want to download it because I don't know what I'll do if I. Oh, we got it here right there. Can't open device COM7. Oh, of course it won't open device COM7. I unplugged it. <laughs> My headache is gone, by the way, completely. So, but now it's the lightheaded part. <laughs> Back there. Okay, let's try this again. Upload it. That's where I do things like forget to plug in the, the device I want to program. Okay, it looks like it's connected or downloaded. Red and yellow. And I can get uh, how far from away from here. Oh, this is not good. I gotta start. I gotta reprogram this thing again because I did not tie my knot. <laughs> That's no problem. Actually, I shouldn't have to reprogram because it, it should keep the same program that was last in there. We'll find out here. Oh, my ground pin came off. That's why it's not turning. Ground is not ground anymore. There we go, now ground is ground. Now it's not stopped all the way. It's still turning a little bit because this particular motor's not been zero, but you can verify that going one direction, then almost stopping, and then going in the other direction. So you can see it probably. If it doesn't quite stop, it just goes real slow, right? Okay, it should stop if I, I think I played with it one time, it's like, you know, it's not like 11, 1350 or something like that, or, you know, there was some number right around that that, that actually stopped right there. So again, I'll do the same thing, I'll hook up the scope right here, and I'm going to put the scope right here. And I'm going to uh, find my scope probe. There's one, one wire. There's that. There's my other two motors. There's this that I can't use anymore. This I don't need. This I don't need anymore today. And I'm missing there. It is. I'm missing the, the little two wires that go to my scope connectors right here. So again, I go to ground, and unfortunately, they're both brown that I brought right here, and then pin nine or pin eight right here. And what you'll see again, it's going one direction. They're supposedly stopped. And there it's going the other direction. Right there. Stop. The other direction. So you can see, all I'm doing is just changing the pulse width. Back there. So, again, if I had, there's actually a capture I guess I can buy from my laptop where I plug that in. And you put the scope reading up there because I had no type of laptop. That's it. But that's basically what I wanted to kind of talk about today was 
a couple of the different types of motors and how we control them. I didn't do the DC example, but again, the only thing we do on the DC is we just, to go faster, we increase the uh, pulse width. To go slower, we decrease the pulse width. Here for the servo, we have to set particular pulse widths, and I'm going to stop there, everything here. Okay. We set the particular pulse width right there. Now, one of the things that is not mentioned about in the servo, right there, is that when we look at this servo motor right here, internally, and they don't show it, internally there's electronics in there that does this calculation. It's actually got its own microcontroller within the servo motor itself. So that it interprets these pulse widths in order to drive the correct signals to the motors to do what they're supposed to do right there. As users, we don't have to worry about the internal microcontroller, just how to program the servo. But you treat the servo as a programmable motor right there. And these servos can be quite powerful. These ones here that I've got actually came from a project from another class I've taught where we built robotic cars that there. So I had one servo for the steering mechanism and then another two servos for the drives right there. So we use servo motors to build the robotics cars right there. So that there. So but uh, we're, we're, we, I can't afford to buy that many servos here. Actually, the students in that class had to buy their own. It was quite expensive. <laughs> I think the students spent, when they took that class for parts, they spent about 400 USD for <laughs> for all the parts for the class. So I expect every student in this class to spend 2,000 ringgits for parts for this class is not a reasonable expectation. That's why you're not building robotic cars <laughs> right there. So, All right, with that said, I am going to end my day. I managed to get through a full hour of discussion, which is about my normal. Uh, we won't meet this afternoon, so pass that around to your friends. I'm not going to put it up on Facebook. I am trying to think about whether I want to do a lab next week. If we do a lab next week, it'll be the same thing as the previous week, where we meet, you know, half will meet at 12, and the other half will meet at 3. Uh, it's just that having two meetings in the same class the same day doesn't really work for me. <laughs> It doesn't work for you because uh, at there because it's just you know I I could do eight hour workshops all one material through three days in a row and that works okay actually my eight hour workshops turn into really six hour workshops because they start at eight in the morning you go till about nine thirty or so you take a half hour break and then you come back so now it's ten you go to about eleven thirty and then you get ready for lunch. Actually, they don't, normally they don't really start till 9, and we go to 10.30, then we take a half hour break, and then we go till 12, and then the time we come back after prayers, it's 1.30, that there, and then you go to about you know, 3 o'clock, you take another half hour break, and then you go till about 4 o'clock or so, and then you're done that there. So, so in reality, 8 hour seminars are really more like 6 hours when you look at real teaching time that there. So... And actually, in the U.S., a one-hour class is scheduled to be 50 minutes, and, a, and an hour-and-a-half class is scheduled to be 75 minutes at there. So an hour and 15 minutes at there. So a three-hour class in the U.S. means roughly 150 minutes a week. 